welcome Oscar to Fully Booked. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Megan. Nice to meet. Nice to be here. Super excited to wow. talk about the book. I'm so happy and glad that you've made the time to speak with me about Calling for a Blanket Dance. This is your debut novel, literary fiction, stunning story told from many perspectives. Uh, how how do you describe the novel and, and what's at the heart of it? Okay, yeah, uh, the novel is, um, it's family fiction, multi-generational. Um, it's told from, um, you know, 12 different narrators are in the novel. So we hear, basically the structure of it is you hear from 11 family members about this main character, Evergima Saddle, and then in the last chapter, Evergima Saddle speaks for himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically the trajectory of it has Evergima Saddle uh, kind of dealing with this uh, building up of aggression and trying to figure out how to live with honor is how I describe mm. it. Mm, beautiful. Yes. Okay. So, so now we know we are getting 12 perspectives, including Ever's perspective on, mm -hmm. on, on the man he, he becomes. Um, all the voices are from the same family. Um, how did you choose that approach to telling the story of Ever? Um, well, you know, one of the dynamics that I um, was playing with is that I want, needed to capture, I wanted to capture like a communal kind of tribal um, dynamic. And it kind of, it's based off of, um, to a certain degree, um, our blanket dances that we have at our Gort dances. So you know, on our Kawa Komechi, um dances, we have something that's called a blanket dance. And the blanket dance is... Um, the, the structure of the blanket dance is to come up to the edge of the blanket and offer like um, some money to help out somebody in need. And so the the basic structure of the novel was kind of built off of that, where we have different family members stepping up and um, doing their part to try to help guide every Gima saddle on, on his journey. And so that's where the, you know, that kind of di wanted to go between different family members um, right. came into being and um, and wanted to capture a novel that had peripheral narration, mm. you know, where we're hearing uh, a story about a character from other characters. Yeah. Um, just wanting to try to take that on as well. I, I spent a chunk of my morning reading your really excellent blog and I, I oh, okay. it, yeah, it's, it's illuminating. It cuts through the BS. Like you, you, yeah. you speak directly of, and you, you broaden access to these kind of more rarefied concepts like peripheral narration and polyvocality. You know, mm -hmm. I even, I'm even tripping over that, you know, and you point out that the great Gatsby is also an example of peripheral narration. It is. Like so that's book. one of the dynamics that I wanted to, you know, especially when we're looking at The Great Gatsby. So we're looking mm. at a novel that is about um, the uber rich and kind of the underbelly of the American dream um, mm -hmm. through that lens. Whereas Calling for a Blanket Dance is um, through the lens of the working poor. Um, so yeah. we look at the American system and how working class people um, have certain types of ob obstacles, but also certain you know, a value system, certain um, sets of ideologies based on the fact that they are working class, working poor. Right. And it, it's it's interesting because a lot of, you know, all, through the reading of this book, you know, part, one thing I had floating kind of around in my mind was the idea of distribution of resources and how it is so often unequal. And it's like, and who gets to tell what story about who mm -hmm. and, and which people get that kind of Great Gatsby treatment in fiction. Yeah. Yeah, right. you know that that that's super important in that um yeah, who is speaking and so in it like in the in my debut novel, we get to hear from the community. It's like the community itself um yeah. has its voice as opposed to like it being just one individual um telling this story. It's it's a it's a community effort. So there's you know this kind of effort toward an attempt at having um equality you know, mm -hmm. equal distribution of power within the community. Yeah. Um, one thing I thought was cool was the first perspective we get, the first voice we hear is a woman's voice. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Ever's grandmother. Would you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah. So Lena Stop is his grandmother. And um, I took the Stop last name because that's actually my um, my family name on my Cherokee side. Oh. Um, I, I'm a Stop. And so I used it in the novel. And um so Lena Stop is to a certain degree based off of my grandmother, who was, um, you know, 
you know, she's a little rough around the edges, very to the point. And kind of like how you mentioned about with my blog, I'm kind mm-hmm. of, it's kind of like strict, no BS, just straight to yeah. the point. And that's, that's kind of how my fiction is. My fiction is, is very much like based in realism. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't do a, a ton of treatment on like, um, reinforcing any type of fantasy about native communities. And so Lena stop is kind of, and I'm glad that she, you know, I like that she, she leads us into the, into the novel because she has kind of a gritty personality. You know, like she's yeah. really direct, directly to the point, you know, like she'll, she'll, you know, she'll cut you with her words and then laugh about it. And, <laughs> um, and so there's a, a quality about her that, you know, that I like. Um, but I think that she is just, um, she's just someone who is going to tell you how it is, you know? Right. Yeah. She, and, um, and so that's the main character's grandmother. And, um, so to start off the novel, we, I wanted to capture this sense of, um, of wherever Gima saddle is from. So we're, you know, we're juggling two different tribes here. So we go Cherokee and then the next chapter is Kiowa. And that kind of goes back and forth throughout the novel. Um, but to start off with being Cherokee and, and his grandmother, Lena stop, that ever Gima saddle is kind of inextricably tied to her, you know? Yeah. And so Cherokees, we are matriarchal. Um, so we follow a matrilineal descent. So because uh, his grandmother is Cherokee and his mom is Cherokee, ever Gima saddle is Cherokee. And so right. she feels like um, that he should be with her, you know, like that, you know, yeah. like her, like the family should be with her and she should be the one guiding the family um, because she is a matriarch. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, like, her personality comes through and that she's a very strong personality and, um, and, and no, it feels like she knows what's best for the family. Right. And it's, it's so interesting that, you know, it's through this character's eyes that we see there's a, this really horrible active institutional violence against, mm-hmm. against Ever's Ever and Ever's parents. And they're actually, they're returning from visiting uh, the father's side of the family in Chihuahua, in Mexico. And mm-hmm. they're stopped by these corrupt cops and there's terrible act of violence. And, you know, it's Lena who is telling us about this matter of factly. You know, yeah. not glamorizing, not romanticizing and like also, you know, proclaiming her concern for how that affects ever who's just a baby in this opening chapter. You know, she's talking yeah. about children who witness violence. Um, I pulled a few lines. They could be witched, their spirit forever altered. A witching was almost incurable, you know. Mm. So yeah. it's like that kind of sets everything rolling right from there. It does. Yeah. That, that's super important. That is so, and that, you know, like I got the chills when you read that. It's just mm-hmm. so important to the novel in that, um, that these kinds of acts of violence, you know, like this, it's a terminology that we use in native communities. Like you can be witched. Um, mm-hmm. it can be like, um, in the sense of being, you know, that like a negative, like putting bad medicine on somebody, like there's that kind of witched, but there's also, if we um, are traumatized by something like violent or something big happens to us, um, we will we'll describe that as also being witched. Mm-hmm. And so in the novel, um, Ever Gima Saddle, he's only six months old, but he is present whenever his father is like brutally attacked by these corrupt police on the border. And as we all know that that border, that that's like a corridor, uh, you know, like a corridor of hell for families, you know, families yeah. are trying to get back and forth. Like he's just trying to go see his parents in Aldama, yeah. Aldama Chihuahua. And then they visited and they're coming back and they're, you know, just trying to get home. And, um, and so this kind of corruption that happens on that, in that corridor. But um, so um, Lena Stop views it in, from her perspective, and she's kind of straightforward about everything. You know, even whenever she's yeah. talking about her husband Vincent Gima Saddle, she's just very direct about him too. Um, yes, but she describes that in detail um, because to her, that is the that's the tragedy of ever. Yeah, you know, like if I go up to if I you know. You know, if I go up to one of your relatives and say, and I ask them, you know, what's the most important um, story you could tell me about Megan? Yeah. You know, and every relative is going to tell you something different. Yeah. Your your uncle, your auntie, your grandmother, your grandfather, they're going to tell a different story because everybody thinks um, the most pivotal story about you is 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 different. And so yeah. in this situation, Lena Stop would, would tell this story. Like, you know, whenever ever was a baby this happened to him and this kind of put him on this path. Um, he was witched when he was a baby and, 
And I just don't know if I, if he's ever going to get out of it. Does he ever get out of it? Um, and that in the, the last, the very last sentence in that particular chapter is mm-hmm. where um, Lena Stop asks, you know, will my grandson ever be cured? Right. Well, the, to return to the last sentence of yours that I read, a witching was almost incurable. I get a little twinkle when I read the word almost there because, mm-hmm. you know, like it, it's 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 inarguable that what he witnessed was horrifying. You know, and that's that that has the power to change the tide of a life. But yeah. almost almost there's hope in that word to me. There, yeah. So that's, you know, that, yeah, that, I mean, that's one of the dynamics I want to keep at play here. And then we see that happen you know, as, as, as the novel progresses. Mm-hmm. Um, we see certain family members changing themselves, you know, like mm-hmm. we get with Vincent Gimasato, like he's, yeah. he's like hit rock bottom and he's like, these are my grand, my grandsons. And, um, and he takes them to a gort dance. And then he's like, all of a sudden he's being honored because he was a, uh, a uh, veteran from the Korean War, and he's just, he doesn't realize what's, you know, happening until, until he's being honored and he's up there dancing. But he never tells his sons, like, oh, when you get up to dance, you got to do this and you got to, you dance this certain way, you got to bob a certain way, you got to hold your rattle a certain way. He doesn't explain anything to him. He yeah. just gets up there and starts dancing. And then he sees his grandsons doing, follow, following him exactly. And so in that moment, he's like, oh, look at my grandsons. You know, they followed in my footsteps so perfectly and I didn't even have to say anything. And then all of a sudden it scares him. You see now your description of that scene just gave me chills because that is that's such a beautiful and powerful scene where the Mm -hmm. boys pick up and they they can follow in in. They just have kind of like this inherent wisdom and they they are participating right alongside him. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think that, you know, that next step in that second chapter, you know, does show like this sense of like you had mentioned that kind of slither of hope, you know, as you're yeah. reading through the novel, like, OK, there's, you know, people are making changes, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're starting to see like, oh, this is the way things are going. I need to make things better. And um, and just so that, you know, like there's these moments of enlightenment almost like, OK, yeah. I'm aware now of what is happening and I need to be a, a, a different type of influence. Mm. So is to call for a blanket dance, like the act of that is, mm-hmm. is an act, is an act of hope. Yes. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very, very much so. And so the, you know, the blanket dance, it's an, it's an important ritual mm. in powwow culture. Um, so, you know, the basic kind of, um, dynamic of it is that if someone's in need, you know, we're at the traditional powwow, these are small powwows, you know, like a lot of times when we think of powwow, we think of these really big um, events with, you know, like, you know, a hundred dancers and that kind of thing. But the powwows I'm referencing are really small, traditional powwows with families who have known each other for a very long time, you know? Um, So what will happen is that if someone's in need, it's it's basically you're you're in front of your you're with your family. So it's not you're like you're around strangers. Um, You put down a blanket and say, oh, this relative, you know, she can't make it to her doctor's appointments because she don't have enough gas money. You know, and so we'd like for you to come out here and honor um, this lady and 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 offer what you can. You know, so that's kind of the premise of it is to kind of is to help out each other um, whenever we're kind of in need, you know? Mm. And, um, yeah. and so every game of finds himself in that position later in the novel. Yeah. And, um, and so we get to see that ritual play out. A phrase that, that appears multiple times in this novel is uh, second chance or second, second chances. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. and I, now it's all swirling around in my brain with, you know, what we talked about, about who gets to tell what story and a portioning of resources and who has them to give and who needs, I mean, like many resources, second chances can be unequally distributed. Um, yeah. and it's about who has a power to grant them. You know, you think about overarching like American culture as like patriarchal white supremacist, kind of like stern daddy who's going to whoop you if you step out of line. But if you have all of those qualities, if you are that that person, the rules don't apply to you in the same way. And it's mm-hmm. just like I, I got the feeling that like second chance, you know, in in these cultures, you know, in Kiowa culture, you know, is more expansive than that. Like second doesn't have to be number two and that's you're done. Mm, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good, that's a very good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, the term, the term second chances, yeah. you know, you get another opportunity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, the, one of the dynamics that's playing out in the novel 
and that I thought, you know, that was just very important to me, it was to capture the process of decolonization. Yeah. And so in in the fact that our communities have been so traumatized historically um, and we're trying to kind of build ourselves back up and we're looking at the culture as a solution um, that we look at redemption. We look at second chances as a means to find our way through that process. Right. And and so we get to a point in the novel where ever Gima Saddle is um is kind of he's he's hit rock bottom himself at that point. And um and his families come in to try to help him out. They're trying to pick him up or try to give him signals to to so he can pick himself up. Um and um and those second chances become super important in um Evergreen Masato's life and in, in, in offering him an opportunity to redeem himself. Mm, beautiful. Um the cover. I read mm-hmm. that you like you like to talk about it, and I was wondering if you would gift our listeners a little bit of the story of how this really striking cover came to yeah. be. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I love that cover. I yeah. actually just I just got the um the final version oh. uh, yes, yesterday in the mail. Um, so I came home and there was like 12 boxes filled with books. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness. And I was like, <laughs> and I just had to get into it as quickly as I could. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that the, that image is super important. And so this cover, you know, like it's really striking. Yeah. It does, it does what it needs to as far as like, oh, this is interesting. Let me look deeper into this book and see if it's something that I want to engage with. Um, but on the, as far as, you know, like the symbolic representation of that image uh, becomes even more important um, whenever you, when you, after you've read the novel. Yeah. So you can read the novel and then you go back and look at the cover and you're like, oh man, that makes so much sense. Like <laughs> right. the, the fracture, you know, the face mm-hmm. being fractured, like yeah. he is fractured and he's, he's healing. You know, the process, mm-hmm. the process of decolonization, the, the sash coming out of the character's head with the dollar, the crumpled dollar bill. So whenever we honor someone, we crumple up that dollar bill and we drop it at somebody's feet and we dance alongside them. So this character, he's trying to live with honor, you know, like that's in his mindset. That's what he's thinking mm-hmm. about. That's his world. And it's inextricably connected um, to his communities. And so we see the sash, the Gort dance sash come out with the red on top of the blue, which signifies that the character is Kiowa. So if it was navy blue on top of red, Mm. um, to us anyway, in our traditional ways, it would signify that the character was Comanche. But because it's red on top, um, it shows that this character is Kiowa. Um, And so that, you know, it captures that really well. But in addition, I mean, I mean, just that. That, that part of it is, is pretty phenomenal. And I'm, you know, was super excited about that part, but as, but also that the, the, the full design of the cover itself with the grid, there's like the squared grid on the background. Yeah. And, um, and as you read the novel and you come back and you see the, how Lena stop, you know, she makes quilts, right. And she makes yeah. these grandchild quilts and I actually got that from my mother makes grandchild quilts for my kids. Um, and, and her, you know, my siblings, kids, you know, so, um, that's where I got it from, but what it ties back into the last chapter. And then, so when you, what you're looking at, is not just that image, it's that you're looking at one of Lena's quilts. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely unforgettable. This is, this is a good one. And it's, it's fun to hear the excitement in your voice as you described it. So thank you. Oh, thank Thank you. you Yeah, no, I am super, (laughs) super excited about that cover. Um, speaking of your voice, I understand that you recorded a big part of the audio book. Um, oh, would you yeah. tell me about that? Yeah. So I was excited to hear that I was um, I was going to get to record the book, you know, like I was going mm-hmm. to be able to narrate um, all the male chapters in the book. Um, you know, like we mentioned, it's polyvocal. So yeah. half the characters are male, half the characters are female. And um, and so. You know, like it was important to me to be able to capture the difference between Kiowa and Cherokee, Mm -hmm. you know, like community members. And so whenever they approached me, like, um, would you be interested in potentially um, reading for the um, novel? You know, I got super excited. I did have to audition for it. Really? Yeah, I had to record myself (laughs) reading one of the stories. But that, you know, that um, that Kiowa voice is so distinct. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to hit those inflections just right. And so I think that they heard that and they picked up on it. And so they were like, oh, no, we want Oscar to read this. Um, so I sent that in and they said, yeah, they gave me the green light. And then so on the 
the characters that are um that are red that are female um rainy fields is mm. the is the reader and she's creek and cherokee also um so she's a tribal member and she's mm. reading all the female characters and so she also did the audio book for therese mayett's um book as well um so oh, heartberries so she, Heartberries, yeah. 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 She she did the, the audio book cool. for that one. And so um I was super excited when she got on board and I think it's gonna be a pretty awesome, awesome audiobook. You're making me want to listen to it. Now I'm not a big I gotta admit, I'm not a big audiobook guy, but I wanna listen to this one. Oh, cool. Thank you. I'm excited yeah. about it. Oh man. Okay. Um what else are you? Our time together is swiftly. You know, just, yeah. We're like we're, we're cruising to the end. So I just want to say, like, what else are you excited about? Is there anything else you want our listeners to know about the book? Any other thoughts from this conversation together? I've been having a ball speaking with you. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. Yeah, I was really excited <laughs> to do this, and um, and uh, you know, like I'm I'm working on book two right now, kind of polishing it up, and uh, have a first draft for a book three. So I'm steadily, you know working toward the, you know, stuff coming up um, mm. in the next year or so. We'll see how it all kind of plays out. Um, yeah. But yeah, still working on other projects and that, you know, I think that a lot of my fiction in the long run is going to be like a, a family fiction that's kind of youth focused. Yeah. Um, that's been my life. I've worked with um, um, at risk native youth for 20 years. Mm. Um, so wow. that's been my history. I'm a father. I have six kids. You know, so and I had my yeah. first grandkid like five months ago. And so Aww. being being a dad um, um, and being a youth worker has kind of been my life. Um, so, yeah. I, you know, my my writing going forward is probably going to be, you know, pretty much like family fiction and with a youth kind of component to it. Mm. And so, like, what's what's it been like for you with your family? Like, have they gotten to read early copies of the book? Like, what's the response been to, you know, you're you're a big author now. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, no, I have. Um, I've been able to give some of the, my family members the 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 ARC, yeah, um, the advanced reader copy, and um, and they all you know like dived into it right away and they're like, oh man, it's so good, and we're so excited about this, and and then also like running into community members just because you know like I post on social media and other mm -hmm. people like in the community share it, and uh, so it's fun to run into people and they're like, oh, I keep seeing your face everywhere, you know, like that's kind of cool. Um, and then yeah. also like, Hey, you're that guy that wrote that book, you know, you know, having people come <laughs> up to me like that. And, but it's exciting to talk to people in the community, like in my native community about the book. Well, I'm so excited for you. I can't wait for more readers to get their hands on this book and I'm going to be a fan for life. I can't wait for book two. Oh, thank Oscar, you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining me today. I'm fully booked. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.